Hi, everybody. Rebecca Nelson with Becker Vineyards with you once again tonight. We're going to do another virtual tasting. Um, this one is, this week is going to be really interesting. We have sent out all library wines. So that means these are wines that are no longer available in our tasting room. Um, we pretty much sold out of them, um, but Dr. Becker really enjoyed these ones in particular, some of the ones that he enjoyed. So we tried to grab a few cases before they were all gone to put them in our library, our cellar, and hold those, see how they age, bring them out for special events, things like that. And so we always do, um, usually about six or seven months out of the year, we offer library tastings at the winery when we're open on Saturdays. And you can actually come and we'll have three wines from the cellar and it's downstairs in our library. And you can really get the idea of tasting wines from different vintage years or all wines from a particular, from a particular year and noticing some of the um, things that are the same from wine to wine in a particular vintage and also noticing the things that are different in the same wine but from different vintages. And so I think this is gonna be a really interesting week that we have for you guys. I know nobody wants to take notes, but I would suggest maybe jotting a note down or two about each wine so that when we get to Friday, you kind of have something to look back at. Tonight, we're starting with the 2016 Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve from the Wilmoth Family Vineyard. And tonight we also have with us, once again, Dr. Richard Becker. We have our winemaker, John Leahy, and we also have our assistant winemaker and enologist, Rachel Fanning. So I'm going to turn it over to the three of them, and they're going to get you guys started on this fantastic wine. I really hope you all enjoy it. Cheers. Cheers, Rebecca. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Sorry, I started laughing when you said, and there'll be some things that are the same, but different. Different. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which accurately describes everything about winemaking. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So, uh, so Doc, would you, uh, before we get going and I get rambunctious, would you, would you give us a few words, please, sir? Because the words are that um, we've had such uh, chaos and tragedy in our country in the last weeks and months. And uh, these few moments uh, of tasting wine, tasting these wonderful wines from uh, Jet Wilmoth uh, are dedicated to all of the resilient spirit that, that, uh, that allows us to fight the pandemic of COVID virus, that allows us to fight the terrible unemployment, allows us to fight the, the, the terrible problems we've had with race, race relations in our country. And I'm remembering what Martin Luther King said, that it's, it's very difficult to ask a bootless man to pull himself up by his own bootstraps. And so anything that we can do to help with that, we wanna do. And for a moment, of levity and, and, and enjoyment of a wine made in Texas. That moment is dedicated to those, to those difficult tasks. That very well said. Um, the only other thing that I would like to add on to there, if you don't mind, is that uh, for me personally, my, my heart and, and my love go out to all of my fellow Americans. So everyone straight across the board. So thank you for joining us all here. And I would love to bring just a few moments of uh, enjoyment and rest and relaxation to everyone. And we're gonna lead off with Rachel because she uh, has the better cheat sheet than I do on the 2016 okay. Wilmot uh, Vineyards Cabernet Sauvignon, which is what we're pouring tonight, everyone. So we're starting off the 2016. A quick note, we'll be doing the 15 on, on Wednesday and the, the 14 on Friday. If for some weird reason you wanna save all three bottles and open them up all at once on Friday, I'll go through a few things with you on Friday for that. But if you'd like to follow along, like Rebecca suggested, take some notes. It's a wonderful thing. If you have a, a wine keeper and you wanna keep the bottles and then try them all again together on Friday, do so. Uh, otherwise I say, enjoy the glass as the day happens. So Rachel, um, would, you, would you lead us off in a swirl and a sniff and a taste? Absolutely. These are some of my favorite things to do. So give it a good swirl. And just, I mean, isn't that just a beautiful nose? I just love it. So again, 2016, Wilmoth family, um, the, the name of their vineyard is actually D. Monte Doble Vineyards. Um, they're located in Tokyo, Texas, which we, you know, we highlighted their wines over the last several weeks. So, and I've already Googled it myself whenever I say you can't Google Tokyo, Texas, and it doesn't show up on that. <laughs> It's basically the intersection with a down gas station that went down a long time ago. More accurately, it's where the family, uh, the Wilmoth family lived. They kind of own the town of Tokyo, I think, I feel like. Um, Jet's Vineyard is a, a beautiful 
vineyard. It's a, it, to me, it is so, it's such a great depiction of a West Texas vineyard with that red, very red West Texas soil. And that terroir comes across all the time in his wine. Um, so again, this particular wine, 2016, it's about 81% cab from his vineyard. It's about 17% Merlot, also from his vineyard and 2% Cabernet Franc from a vineyard down the road in Meadow, our farm, farmhouse vineyard crew. Mm -hmm. So what, okay, let's get back to the swirl, sniff, and taste. So that's, I want your impressions. Okay. All right, ready for that one. <laughs> Every time, right? Every time. <laughs> um, oh, goodness. Can you... <laughs> How often do you see me like speechless over what do I get out of a right. glass of wine? <laughs> um, one of the things that I love about this wine is the, um, and this again, to me, it's it's pretty consistent through the reds that we get from Jet. The um, It almost has like a cinematic, this is not the right word, I think I'm making up a word, a cinematic um, tactile dryness to it that just, you, you get those cinnamon layers to it, but it's that dryness. Yeah, and I know I seem redundant, but because I'm really serious about it, it's that terroir from that red soil that he grows everything in. Um, I get nice pyrazines off of this, those nice herbaceous kind of a, to me it's more like a green peppercorn mm -hmm. than it is um, bell pepper or jalapeno or um, you know, any other green beans or any other things we might often see in, in wines. And the fruit is lovely, nice big red, dark red, very ripe berries, blueberries, blackberries. Oh, absolutely. So, so Doc, what, what do you get when you, with your first impressions on your taste? My first, you know, my first impression is that this is, um, is this wine more like, like a um, Napa Cab or is this wine more like a, a Bordeaux? And um, for me, it's more Bordeaux-like. It's, um, so is this Aubryon John? Is this Mouton? Is this Lafitte? Um, where would you where would you put this? I think it's Aubryon like. I, well, I, I appreciate that that Aubryon absolutely, but I, I'm going to go more Lafitte, to uh -huh. tell you the truth, because I actually do think it's more like a Napa Cab a little bit. Um, uh -huh. I like um, what I really really like when I when I got here in 2012. You know, um, Jet Wilmeth and of course Brenda and and Dwayne Canada were some of the first people I met when I went on my first vineyard tour and looking at those vineyards. And it was really exciting for me because they, even though they're only like 12, 15 miles apart, um, or, or I guess closer to 20 miles apart, but the uh, the soil is so different between the two. And then with jets, with that, that sandy loam, that really, as Rachel said, that dark red dirt, um, I was very excited to get this fruit in. It really, uh, to me, it's a great lead off to introduce the idea that Texas is a world-class Cabernet producer. Um, I agree. Jet, you know, Jet spends an inordinately large portion of his life tending these, these vines. And I know some years are more frustrating than others. Jet, he is on here with us, so <laughs> I can appreciate that. But, you know, Rachel, I, I, I like that, that, that layness, layers of dryness, but what I really find interesting out of here is the dried fruit aspect. Um, this is 16 and yet it's, it's aging beautifully so far. Um, makes me very excited for the 15 and the 14 to try. But this is- The pistol, the pistol is striking, John, in this. It is, there's a touch of cedar in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's, um, to me, that's indicative. That little touch of cedar is indicative of both, um, my only other experience with that cedar, I should say, as a winemaker, would be from both the, the Spring Mountain and the uh, Stag's Leap District in Napa. And I get that in here and it just really, it really always shocks me every year when I smell that. And I just think this is beautiful fruit. It's wonderful. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I notice is that the almost dry straw to, to, to light red fruit on that middle area when you're starting to smell it. When you taste it, what do you get on the front and the middle and the back palate? And I am going to come back to you, Rachel, for that. So better take another taste. <laughs> <laughs> so, Doc, what do you get on your front, middle, and back? Well, I get um, I get a, a wonderful fruit, and I, I get this complex dried fruit. Um, 
that which you know which gr the great Napa cams have, and uh, and it's it's more muted in Bordeaux at the, certainly at this point in its life. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, well, I get that in all three phases, um, especially on the mid palate. I think. Yeah, I'm getting um, you know what's amazing to me, and I've got to double check this. Um, yeah, Fourteen point one on the alcohol because the alcohol is so way back mine is not i did not get a chance to chill this in the wine chiller it's it was just sitting out on the on the bar countertop here at the house i decanted it an hour ago and i'm not getting any overt heat on it um what i'm getting first are those pyrazines um mm -hmm. they really <laughs> kind of flooding forward but on my mid palate the dryness where it hits um right across the center of the palate is really wonderful. This is not a wine that I could drink two or three glasses without food. I, I need food for this, but yeah. I, I like as a Cabernet, it's maybe not as dense as some cabs I've had, but it's got that chewiness, the edge of that chewiness and that, that fruit is molding beautifully with those tannins. So Rachel, what do you get front, middle and back? What are you getting? So I do want to touch for a second on what Doc said uh, about it being more of a Bordeaux-like as opposed to a Napa, and I actually side with Doc on this one. Um, and I think to me, it's because some of the fruits are so subdued, but it's almost kind of marrying a little bit of the Bordeaux and the Napa style. Like you said, they're, they're subdued fruits, but they're it's not huge and big and jammy like a lot of Napa cabs are. But they're no, still those aren't real Napa cabs; those are pretenders. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It's not like a pretender cab. Um, it, it does have, a, you know, so much fruit, but it is subdued. One of the things that I really like about this is about somewhere between the end of the beginning of the palate towards the middle of the palate, there's such a, a big amount of like a graphite. There's just like a large amount of granite. Yeah, well, yeah Doc was even mentioning that, that lead. Uh, I get that cedar edge. The, um, mm -hmm. The one thing I'm not getting that I've gotten in previous vintages out of Jets is a, an overt amount of leather, that 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 nice leather <laughs> smell. That's more subdued in the 16. Mm -hmm. I feel so, like that's where we plug in and say, wait till Wednesday and Friday. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's that was also why I was talking earlier to you off camera about the 2012 and trying to find it because I'm, um, anyway, we'll, <laughs> we, we went. Um, and, and I just got a question here. It says, John, talk about why you would uh, chill this. You said you didn't have a chance to put it in your wine cellar. We usually don't chill red wine. Well, I'm sorry that you don't usually chill red wine. I do. <laughs> so <laughs> I chill it down to about 55. I serve Chardonnay and Cabernet at the same temperature. Now, it will rise in temperature as you serve it at room temp. Uh, you know, room temp here in Texas is uh, just below uh, rocket fuel explosion temperature right now. <laughs> so, but I do, um, I like to chill a red wine prior to service, decant and, and serve about half an hour. I'll take it out half an hour or so if it's younger or an hour plus if it's older and I'll put the decanter back in to chill till a half an hour before service. That simply is to mute any of the alcohol that may come forward first and allow the fruit and those subtle notes to come out. Alcohol is always gonna be there but really to get you, your nose attuned to it. That's why I chill it. It's just a personal quirk. Um, I, you know, you don't have to at all. Um, so Doc, tell me about the first time you all met with Jet and, and Gay and uh, what made you decide to get the fruit? Uh, well, gosh, well, very memorable meeting. Uh, actually at their vineyard, I think. Or maybe, I think maybe they came to the winery. They came to the winery after uh, one of the harvests uh, early on, and uh, they wanted to taste the, the 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 juice. They wanted to taste maybe the, the wine we'd made the year for from their fruit, and uh, we had a wonderful visit with them. And it was clear how how dedicated they were to trying to make uh, their portion of the wine the wine so so carefully, and that's just everything for a winery. If you can get get wonderful fruit, you can you've got a chance to make wonderful wine. But that and, and a, a great sense of humor. So, oh, there's no doubt that Jet yeah, Wilmoth has a great sense of humor. Absolutely. Um, and we need uh, it right now, as a matter of fact. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. He's not just got a great sense of humor, he's also got a resilient spirit. Um, what, I, what I love is, is Jet, uh, the first time, I'm, I've probably told this before, but the first time that I met him, he's got a bit of a West Texas drawl. 
and which is, uh, he can super exaggerate that, by the way, and he does frequently. He tries to draw you in with that rather aw shucks attitude, and then he'll put a zinger on you, and it's, it's all funny, um, you know, because he, he, the first time he was just like, well, you know, he does that long pause. I heard you were from California. <laughs> I was like, oh, dear God, here we go. He's like, no, that's just far west Texas. <laughs> just about died right there. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> so, um, all righty, back to this wine because it is, it is doing beautifully. And I cannot remember, but I am pretty sure that this saw a dominant amount of French oak. So uh, yeah. no it is. Ew. yes, Ew. and and I am I'm pretty pretty sure that this was the first year I tried to sneak uh, an all French oak cabernet um, past those who pay attention to such things. Not that they're <laughs> on here listening to me right now. <laughs> so um, so Rachel, what uh, now that you've been swirling and sniffing and tasting? What do you think? What is it that pops to mind? Yeah. I really do. Um, and I'm, I'm, I tend to be, we talk about this a lot in the tasting room, especially now that we have the, the Canada cab vineyard designate and the Wilmoth cab vineyard designate. And it seems like it so often is about 50 50 who loves which one most, right? Everybody loves all of them, but which, which one do you tend to side towards? And uh, please don't be mad at me, Miss Canada, because I love you too. But I really, there's something about the whatever it is that comes across in Jets cabs all the time that I really, really, uh, I love them. And this has been consistent since I've been here. The 2012, I think, was the first one that I sat in the lab and argued with you about blending. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, since then, I just absolutely love the Jet cabs, Wilmoth cabs. We call him Jet. His first name is Jet. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Um... The, the, the two cabs are distinctly different to me. You can set them side by side. We know we're having two different Cabernets for sure. I always yeah. felt like the, the Wilmoth cab came off stronger, younger, and then ages yeah. beautifully. And then the Canada cab comes off a little more muted, young in the bottle, and then just does this rocket slope up after about a year in the bottle or so. And I'm talking the first year of life. Um, after that, they, you know, they, they both have their own lifespan and, and have their own distinct um, ideas and but you know back to the to the Wilmoth cab I really think that we're seeing the, the minerality um, from his area in there I think we are seeing the terroir um, just something very consistent year to year about that Cabernet that is just unbelievable so Doc what what um, you, you mentioned Aubryon uh, prior but why 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 do you compare it to those two for those who cannot be familiar with Bordeaux's, I think it's a, it's a combination of the of the wonderful aroma in this wine, which uh, you know has some some forest floor notes, some humus, um, maybe a, a, a trace of eucalyptus. Uh, mm -hmm. As you say, less leather than we generally experience, mm -hmm. but it, it smells very much like a Bordeaux, and uh, but a, an older one than, than just sixteen. And yeah, I, I, you know, I will, I'm, I'm on that train right there. It does smell like it's got a lot more maturity than, than 16. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, we're talking four years later, but still that, that's relatively young in the life of a cab. You know, we, we have, uh, uh, earlier in the evening, Rachel was drinking an 07, um, Wilmoth, I was glad to hear. <laughs> At least you didn't ask you if you bought your house, Rachel. <laughs> Yet, <laughs> I would like to point out a reminder of where I am in the loop. There's one thing to have the keys to the kingdom. There's another thing to use those keys. <laughs> anyway, you were saying, sorry. Uh, Anyway, so it, it would be fun. It'd be fun to taste that 07, Rachel. If you if you could do us the honor of, of, of you know, maybe on, on one of the other nights and just compare them, that, that'd be Absolutely. fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we have a lot of cheer. Oh, okay. <laughs> Jeez, that that would be great. So you all might be trying the 15, but I'm going to go back to 07. <laughs> <laughs> all about it. Right. Well, I. Uh, 
Okay, well, while we have a pause, I'm starting to see a few questions pop up, and we're going to get to them here, guys. If you have questions, please ask them. Um, we really want you to enjoy this wine, but but also want to start thinking about Wednesday and Friday. So um, if you aren't taking notes, please do. Otherwise, save your broadcast. Um, also, if you're enjoying it, share the broadcast. John, um, let me let me see. You know, there, there's a lot said about how to, how to preserve wine and how to restore it. And in the Cantle, the English wine journal, my favorite wine journal, uh, in the last few weeks, there were comparisons of um, pumping oxygen off of wine, just putting it, put it in a cork and putting it in the refrigerator and freezing it. And uh, to their amazement, freezing it was the best. And uh, this was written by some wonderful, wonderful masters of wine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've done that multiple times. And it's, um, yeah. It's, it's apparently awesome. astonishing. So if you had a half a bottle of this left, you could put it in the freezer. And then and thaw it out and bring it to the temperature of the other wines when you're maybe on Friday. If we do that with tonight and Wednesday, yeah, you'll have all three there. And chances are, once they open and have a half a bottle, it's not going to slush out on them. So, um, you know, that, that's right. It's so, but it does. It, it, it chases that oxygen right off the surface of the wine when you, when you get it that cold. It's really nice. Um, the, um, the gold medal. So we did get a gold medal. You're, um, you know, that's what I was looking for in my notes here. I apologize for looking down away from the camera. Apparently you all know I'm never gonna be a TV star or a movie star. I can't quite figure out the whole camera thing. Um, the Wilmoth did get a gold medal uh, with the San Francisco International in the 2018 competition. And then we got a, a silver, am I saying this right, Rachel? In the, road, in the Houston Rodeo, we got a silver and Texas class champion on this Lisa. one. In yeah. the 2019 competition? Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's done very, very well, but you know, the consistent performers um, from, from the Wilma Vineyard, because our 25th- you, you, you mentioned something about it, it performed well in the Dr. Dr. Pepper competition in Waco, am I? Yeah, am yes, I sponsored by the Dublin Bottling Company, absolutely, yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, those guys in Dublin are never gonna let me back in their soda place ever again. <laughs> so, and, by the way, if you've never gone, what? <laughs> it's the coolest. Oh no, it's the coolest place in the world. <laughs> so, anyway, um, the uh, Wednesday, our 2015, it's a double gold winner. So we want people to, to be there for Wednesday too. So, but I want to get back to the actual culture of the wine. Um, so we, on the 2016, we used a very, very plain and simple yeast. We weren't using anything fancy on there. And we did a very straightforward only a couple of days maceration and then we got it going. So we did old school as far as fermentation on this. I did not do an extended maceration. I didn't jump around in my, you know, all vegan uh, penny loafers and uh, chant to the full moon on the things. What, I'm, I'm making fun of biodynamic people, not vegans. So <laughs> just so you know, <laughs> so you know where to direct the hate mail. Um, the but what we did was just basically a very straightforward fermentation. It was very easy to do that. The ripeness in 2016 was nice and even. Um, you know, we were very fortunate when you look back at 16, 17, and 18 for us. We're very, very fortunate on having that curve of those three years. 19, of course, is developing nicely, but talking about how these wines have developed now over the course of a couple of years, all three of those years were, were consistent for us. You know, 17, of course, peaking. But with the 16, and John, then we went into the, uh, yep. the Cabernet Franc is, was equally ripe for this. Yes, you remember? Was. Yes, yeah. and then so it's, that was that's early on. To get yes, and yeah. that was early on too on Cab Franc from the farmhouse. So um, you know it, there was not uh, a whole um, whole lot of it, but what came in was because you know, it was young vines came in was extraordinarily evenly ripe. Um, so yes, it did very well. And doing the blending trials on that, you know. Normally, I have the the Jet Merlot and then the Jet Cab, and they go together beautifully, you know, in, in different levels of combinations each year. Um, this particular year, I felt the the Cab Franc, as Rachel mentioned earlier, there's some really nice pyrazines that come together and just kind of peek out in there, and that's that Cab Franc just binds everything together. It's um it's like I don't know um, how other the way to say it. It's that final little touch of ingredient in the in the soup that just puts everything together. Well, it's just a kiss a cap franc. Yeah, just a pinch. <laughs> and 2% really is not a lot when you consider we did not bottle a whole lot, whole heck of a lot of this. I mean, no, we, we made 2,500 gallons of it, um, a little over a thousand cases. So, I mean, that's not, 
it sounds like a lot, but it really, really is not a lot. Um, the, uh, uh, anyway, going back to then the barrel program, um, we did do a, uh, on the neutral oak, we did stir the leaves on this one. So we've been doing that consistently each year with the, with the Wilmoth. Um, during uh, ML, waiting for ML to finish, we stir up the leaves a little bit. So we got a little bit of glycerol buildup in there initially. And then we just put it away. We didn't touch it. We literally put it back in the cellar and we were done until we decided to come out and blend it. So it was a um, pretty straightforward. The fruit really did make this wine itself with, with virtually no manipulation. Okay, guys, we're getting to that point. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna touch on it. We talked about this a little bit the other day as well. Um, that I think that's one of the really nice benefits that we have is whenever we can put these, you know, we let them finish their fermentations in oak mm -hmm. and, um, and then let them just sit. And that benefit of sitting on their leaves on all of that, the yeast and the, all the goodness, we call it goodness mm -hmm. in there, that um, helps build so much body and gives it such a nice voluptuous viscosity, you know, that good mouthfeel, I think. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, we got a question here, and uh, and Angela, she's one of my favorite questioners. She's been with us forever. Um, so Angela asks, since you mentioned vegan, are your wines considered vegan? I know there are many out there that aren't due to some part of the winemaking process. Angela, I'm I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give you my very honest and straightforward answer. I will never say our wines are vegan, for the simple reason that I have two tools available to me that are animal byproducts for fining. I have not used them in the last couple of years. That does not mean I'm going, not going to use them in the next couple of years. So I, I hesitate to say that because I know it's very important to people. And you know, I will tease you no matter who you are and what, what you do, I will always tease you, but I will never actually ridicule you for, for what you want. No, I will not say our wines are vegan. I will say this particular wine, 2016, could certainly be considered vegan friendly. I did not use any type of animal byproduct like fish bladder for fining or anything. But I do not right. make a blanket statement on any of our wines saying that they're vegan. Donna, a mouse in the wine tank? I mean, uh, no, no, no we, we fished that little sucker out. Uh, Stuart Little, um, we sent him on his way on the next adventure, so he's okay. Uh, so <laughs> look at Rachel just going, would you guys stop it? <laughs> but back, back to Angela, no, um, you know, Angela, I'd be happy to, to answer you on a specific wine, but I can't give you a blanket on there. And I, I apologize for that. And I appreciate your concern, but um, th this, this particular wine, we did not use any kind of animal byproducts in. So um, that being said, we're back to food pairings. <laughs> so sorry to segue that. Uh, out now. Um, and now Angela, you know why I drive my wife crazy because I'm ADD all over the board. So Rachel, food uh, pairings with this wine. Absolutely. Do not so say I, beef tenderloin. <laughs> I won't. You know, I have thought about this for the last several hours. I'm like, must come up with something different because you know what we're all going to say with the cab is a steak. Find yeah. something else find something else that it pairs with beautifully. And I came up with, a, how about a, a nice, rich mushroom soup or beef stroganoff? That's what I want. I think so too. <laughs> I am gonna go back to Trish. Uh, she just added in there, no egg whites, ox blood or Isinglass. Trish, we've not been able to use dried ox blood since the mid sixties legally in any of the wine industries. Not even wet ox blood. Yeah, so no, <laughs> blood finding went out with, oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> A long time ago. So Doc's just sitting there shaking his head. Oh, we, we normally do not use egg white fining in our wine. We don't have a tannin management issue. Um, mm -hmm. Egg whites are pretty, pretty hard tannin management. If you have a lot of harsh tannins, a small amount of egg whites will take those tannins right away. We do not have that issue. So no, and no, we do use Isinglass every once in a while. I did not use Isinglass on this, which is the fish bladder that I mentioned before. So Doc, Thinking about food. Uh, I would say Jason, Jason Dady's uh, mushroom soup. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. And uh, Coco Van. Coco Van would be very, very nice. Um, I personally think that sitting in a small cabin, having caviar and a side of champagne to wash the Bordeaux down would be a really nice thing. <laughs> I. Um, you know, to be honest with no, you, that, that's not a cabin. That's an outhouse you're talking uh, about. Oh, oh, God, that's, a, that's <laughs> so tiny. 
I felt like you were focusing a little much on your upcoming vacation. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, you know, uh, dark dark chocolate uh, would go very well with this. You know, with this is the key that we have discovered in the last couple of years with the Wilmoth Cabernet. It does so beautifully with so many different desserts. We break every rule in the book when we pair a sweet dessert with a dry red wine. And I encourage everyone to go out there and be rule breakers. You know, if you want to make progress, break a few rules. I, I will have to say a flourless chocolate tort or a, uh, a nice cheesecake does very, very well with this. So I'm going to go desserts tonight because uh, I'm really now thinking I need a dessert. <laughs> so, hey, before um, before we go any further, I do want to mention, and I, before I forget everybody out in, in wonderful land, um, next week we have a wonderful lineup that I want to encourage everybody to be a part of. We're going to be doing the Sanye on Monday, the Atuno on Friday, but on Wednesday we're doing the United Blend, our our co-opted blend between us and uh, the Francis Ford Coppola Winery. It was a uh, co-made wine that I put together. Uh, and Corey Beck from Francis Ford Coppola will be on with us on Wednesday. He's the head honcho from uh, Family Coppola, uh, winemaker and CEO. So Corey is a wonderful guy. I want you to all encourage you to get on and ask questions that will tease him about his California roots. Um, I don't think there's anything that can make that man I, I just, he's so even keeled. And I wanna see the one question that disturbs him. Anyway, we're looking forward to, uh, to this. It is a uh, blend of 50% Texas and 50% California wine. They made the wine there, I made the wine here, and then they, I brought it out here, we blended and bottled it. So the United blend, uh, that's in next week's pack up. Also coming up for Father's Day, a uh, very important date uh, in, I wanna remind you that we have two different things, special pack ups. Um, we got the Father's Day gift basket that we're putting together that's got the barrel stave bottle opener. This is the coolest thing. It's a little barrel stave bottle opener on the end. You can hang it out by the grill. You can hang it out by the pool. You can hang it up you know, in the garage. We also have a Becker cap, a uh, Becker tumbler, the, our chef uh, has made some uh, grill rub that is fantastic. It's fresh made rub that will include a little jar of that. And also for dad, so just so you don't feel left out of all of the, the beautiful products we gave to mom, we got a special dad soap. It's a black tea soap. It's a dark black, black tea and willow soap that is wonderful. Um, it, it's a more masculine soap. So you got something to wear, something to drink, something to open your drink with, something to grill with, and then something to clean up with at the end. So we got that for $70, includes shipping. And then our, our uh, pack up for Father's Day is the Canada Vertical, the Canada Cab Vertical. So we've done the Wilmoth and now we're gonna go to the Canada Vineyards and do the 2012, the 2014 and the 2015. And that's $120, which includes shipping. So that's for Father's Day. So an exciting two weeks for everybody. Okay, um, if there are no more uh, questions, I'm not seeing any more questions come across here at the moment. Um, I think we should probably wrap things up unless you all have any other words to say about the wine, Doc? Not about the wine, but our, our, our country is about togetherness and compromise and talking and that's who we are. And salute to all of us, so I think. I, I will salute that, uh, absolutely. Um, so Rachel, any final words of wisdom on the wine? Love this wine, really looking forward to that 2007. I clearly just got permission to open. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna hide that bottle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, thanks for joining us again. Um, the uh, uh, one final question, there was one final question. What's the difference between this wine and the Raven? <laughs> this wine's Cabernet, the Raven's Malbec. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, I wanna tell everybody, cheers, great health, Good wine. Have a great Thank week. You, See you all on Wednesday. Thank you, Richard. Ciao.